In the 1840s, legislators and policymakers across the U.S. began to realize that they had a problem. In the early days of the Republic, when the U.S. had first declared independence from Britain, only white male landowners had the right to vote. But voting rights had been expanding steadily since then, and by 1840, most states had dropped the requirement to own property, and over 90% of adult white men had the right to vote. The problem was that although these men had the right to vote, many of them did not have the capacity to vote. They had very little formal education, they were not well informed about civics or the democratic process, and many of them were illiterate. So to combat this problem, states gradually began enacting public school laws. They began putting tax dollars into expanding public schools, and eventually they enacted compulsory education laws, which required male children to attend school until a certain age. As the public schools expanded, new curricula had to be created and new textbooks had to be written. In particular, language arts curricula, which had started as very basic literacy and spelling lessons, and now began to incorporate grammar, composition, and elocution. And of course, the people creating these new curricula and writing these new textbooks were the wealthy white male policymakers themselves. Then, as now, People across the U.S. spoke different dialects of English. A dialect is just a variety of a language, any variety of a language. The dialect that you speak is influenced by your age, your race, your gender, your socioeconomic status, your level of education. People in Georgia speak different dialects than people in Ohio. Teenagers speak different dialects than senior citizens. Blue-collar workers often speak a different dialect than people in the upper income brackets. This has been true of English as long as it has existed, over a thousand years. For most of that time, English speakers had no concept of a standard dialect. There were always different dialects, and that's all they were, different. But as the curricula were created and new textbooks written to fill these expanding public schools, the wealthy white male policymakers writing the textbooks chose their own dialect as the standard, as the model of correctness that kids would now learn when they learned grammar and speech and writing. And public schools adopted this very quickly, and they began not just to teach this dialect, but to teach that speaking or writing anything other than this dialect was wrong. This was a completely new idea, but it spread very quickly through the country, and people began to learn and spread the idea not just that speaking anything other than standard English was wrong, but that the people who spoke anything other than standard English were uneducated, ignorant, even lazy. And it still pervades our culture today. If you're on social media, you've probably seen a meme like this. Maybe you've even shared something like this yourself. It's intended to promote this idea that not just that saying I seen is wrong, non-standard, but that people who say that are ignorant or foolish. That's just not accurate. Linguistically speaking, there is no single correct dialect of English. Let's take I seen as an example. Why is it wrong to say I seen? To see is an irregular verb. It doesn't follow any pattern. It's not particularly logical to say I saw or I seen. Not only that, but this idea that I seen is wrong is relatively new. There was a novel published in York in 1795 called The Life of John Metcalf, and in it we see a really good example of a usage of I seen. Do you not see two lights, one to the right, the other to the left? No, replied the gentleman. I seen but one light, that there on the right. Notice that I seen is attributed to a gentleman in this instance. It wasn't associated with ignorance or lower class speech at all at that time. 
It's only in the last couple of centuries that we have been taught that Icene is wrong. Let's look at another example. Pronouncing ask as ax. And you might think, well, it's spelled ask. Surely that's the correct pronunciation. But keep in mind in English, there's very little relationship between how we spell things and how we pronounce them. <laughs> there's a common linguistic process called metathesis, where the sounds inside a word get mixed around. This happens in English and many other languages all the time. If you say Wednesday rather than Wednesday, or February rather than February, then you participate in metathesis too. And ask and ax are just another example of this process. Both pronunciations have been around in English for over 800 years. And in fact, the most well-known Middle English writer, Geoffrey Chaucer, used ax in his Canterbury Tales in the 1300s. You lovers ax I now this question. It is only again in the last couple of centuries that we have come to think of ax as bad English because we are taught that, not because it's inherently wrong. Let's look at one more example. I was informed a day or two before the receipt of your letter that you was gone to Plymouth. We're taught, again, that that form, you was, is bad grammar, that it's wrong. This was written in, on July 3rd, 1776, by John Adams in a letter to his wife, Abigail. This was a man who was educated at Harvard, who was a practicing lawyer, and who went on to become one of the founding fathers of our nation and its second president. And he used, you was. And this was not an error. It appears repeatedly in his letters between him and his wife, because nobody at that time thought of you was as wrong. It's only in the last couple of centuries that we have begun to think of this as wrong. People have a very hard time with this idea that there's nothing inherently correct about standard English, that it is not inherently superior to other ways of speaking English. And it's easy to understand why the public schools have been very effective in teaching this notion, that standard English is the only correct way to speak and write. They sometimes literally beat it into their students. As one elderly gentleman wrote, the reason why the older generation feels so strongly about English grammar is that we were severely punished if we didn't obey the rules. One split infinitive, one whack, two split infinitives, two whacks, and so on. And the idea still pervades our culture today. But there's a problem with this idea. When we promote the stereotype that some dialects are inferior or ignorant or lazy, then we promote stereotypes that the people who speak them are ignorant and lazy. Think about Appalachian English that's associated with rednecks. Think about any of the Englishes spoken by poor, white, rural Southerners. Think about black English. Think about any dialect that might commonly be called bad grammar, bad English, broken English. These dialects aren't broken. All dialects have their own rules for pronunciation, for grammar, and for vocabulary. They are just as complex and systematic as the rules of standard English. People who speak a stigmatized dialect like Black English or Appalachian English aren't trying to speak standard English and failing any more than people who speak French are trying to speak standard English and failing. They're following the rules of their own dialect, and those rules are just as complex and just as systematic as the rules of standard English. They're just different rules. And the only reason we think of them as wrong is because we've been taught to think of them that way. When we judge a person based on how they speak, then we shut down conversation. And we essentially say that their English isn't good enough to enter into our conversation. And in certain cases, whole demographics of people can be silenced. Not only that, but it can have serious impacts on people's self-esteem. If you tell a child that her speech and the speech of her family and her friends and her neighborhood 
is wrong, is ignorant, is lazy. It can seriously impact how she sees herself and her community. And it can discourage her from speaking up in class, from participating in public debate, from joining public conversation. Now you might be thinking, isn't there value in having a standard variety of the language, a variety that's considered correct in professional life, in academic life? I'm not saying that we should stop teaching standard English altogether. It's certainly useful for teaching English as a foreign language. And American kids also need to know that standard English will be expected in college and in the professional world. We need to be realistic about that. But we can teach it without teaching that other dialects are wrong or inferior. Kids need to learn the complex and fascinating history of their language, just as they learn the history of their planet and their government. They need to learn where these ideas about correctness and these stigmas about other kinds of dialects, where this judgment comes from. And adults need to keep in mind that when we criticize or mock someone for pronouncing ask differently than we do, or even saying something like I seen, or typing the wrong your when you're in an online conversation, then what we are saying to them is, because you don't speak or write like me, I'm not going to listen to what you have to say. And when we do that, we shut down conversation. So, judge what I say, not how I talk. Thank you. <laughs>